Great. Oh, great. Got a lot to talk about today. All right. Great. Hi. Welcome All to right. Scorpio season. Uh, this is our second episode. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm Lisa, and I'm here with my guest today, Venkat. And I'm Venkat, and I'm here today with my guest, Lisa. Cool. Great, Venkat. So, what are we going to talk about today? Um, let's see. We're on bees. Oh, Venkat. Last episode, we didn't talk about why we're going through the alphabet of topics. Do you want to? Oh yeah, yeah. That a little yeah bit? I think I started explaining it and then got sidetracked, which I think is perfect. <coughs> so, in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams, there is this uh, character called Wow Bagger, the infinitely prolonged. And he's an immortal character who, yeah, like lives forever and he's really pissed off about it because he doesn't know what to do with himself for eternity. And what he ends up deciding to do is he's going to insult everybody in the universe in alphabetical order. And that's always been sort of one of my favorite um, characters and especially the particular detail of insulting people in alphabetical order. <laughs> it's like you're no more important than anybody else. So he doesn't even have a priority order. He just wants to insult everybody in prior in alphabetical order. So I, I always like um, that kind of like, uh, whenever you're sort of trying to do very open-ended thinking and discovery around a topic, it's, if you want to kind of be just doing an, you know, inventory taking mode where you're, you don't actually have any priorities or anything, alphabetical order is always a great way to go. So yeah, that's why I thought it would be fun to do one per letter of the alphabet. Great, right. And so today is nominally our B day. We'll see how many of our B topics we get through. Um, I believe the first one we have on our list for today is uh, beefs, which I understand you have a few things to say about beefs. Right? Oh, yeah. So I wrote this article, Internet of Beefs, uh, that has been, I think, my biggest hit in several years now. So it's. Um, the last such big hit I had was in 2017. That was a premium mediocre article. But uh, yeah, I wrote Internet of Beefs and it was kind of an attempt to, to see the culture wars as this um, system of people beefing with each other, kind of like medieval knights in uh, feudal Europe. So mm -hmm. uh, that's my idea of Internet of Beefs. And I think that's kind of how culture works now. Do you have a beef with anybody? Do I have beefs? Uh, I don't think I have beef per se. I definitely have. I don't think I participate in the culture of beefs so much that you've laid out. I definitely have people or things on the internet. I can't like think of one precisely, but you definitely like go off on. Is there anybody you hate read, for example? I think of that as the passive aggressive version of being in a beef people you hate read man i am um, let's see uh i guess i don't like talking about my beefs because that makes it <laughs> like that's yeah, it, some it, kind of weakness here um i don't actually even read his stuff i was like i really don't this, this could probably be a whole topic in and of itself i really uh when i do read it i usually find myself hate reading slate star is it slate star codex scott alexander's oh, slate star codex yes Scott Alexander, yeah, that's his. Uh, that's not his real name, right? Yeah, uh, so he's one of your hate read <laughs> sources. Yeah, yeah he seems pretty harmless, and mm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I don't think he's. I don't know, man. I haven't read enough of his stuff. I think to have like a really strong reason for disliking he, him. He's um, not rational. He, yeah, he, he's definitely. I think the new leader of the rationalist uh, crowd. And uh, I, I think um, if people are generally, I don't know, peaceable and civil in their um, demeanor, and I, I know the word civil has gotten really overloaded these days, but mm -hmm. he, I mean, he's just generally pleasant in his writing. So when people are that way, I tend not to sort of develop either beefs or hate reading relationships. Like one of mine would be probably uh, Nassim Taleb. So even though I've read his books and uh, I don't follow him on Twitter because it's just a danger zone around him. And even though I think a lot of his ideas are very interesting, just the sort of, um, I don't know, violence of his immediate neighborhood 
makes me consider him in my almost hatred category. He's an important thinker to keep up with, but you don't necessarily have to like him. I don't know, man. <laughs> I like, so I, I was really into Nassim stuff. And then I went to see him talk at one point in New York a couple of years ago. Okay. I don't even remember. I think I had just finished reading Anti-Fragile and he was at some Bloomberg barbecue summer net, like presentation event. There's a lot of quantitative data traders. It was in the Bloomberg office in like the Upper East Side where their like big office building is. Anyways, um, it was an interesting crowd. I took, listening to him talk really changed my mind about him as a person, if that makes sense. This is before I found him on Twitter, but he talked about his like <laughs> rigorousness of his um, his research methods was a little like it made it hard for me to take him seriously as an academic. Seeing how this awesome yeah. was made, if that makes sense. Um, and on Twitter, he kind of takes that up a notch even more. Like uh, when he talks about other researchers, it's like uh, it's painful to watch. Like except for the couple of people he seems to like, everybody else is like, uh, I don't know, it's like watching a bad wrestling match or something. Yeah, I mean, I think he has, like, uh, Yeah, I think he has a lot of, um, sorry, I, I think he has a lot of uh, like good points about a certain attitude and insularity of academia. I think he has correctly identified some of the like, um, non-productive incentive structures that exist in academia but i don't know if his way about that he goes about expressing himself is necessarily the most productive or like easy to watch he definitely has a beef he has a beef with academia um oh yeah yeah and there's a sort of assumption of moral high ground that he brings to his beefing that I find really annoying. Like, yeah, academics aren't great. They're full of their own like shit and uh, uh, biases and bad incentives or whatever it is, you know, reproducibly, reproducibility crisis and stuff. But um, the world of um, independent scholars doing their own thing, autodidacts, it's no better. They're humans too. And I think there's a sort of regression to the mean effect where like, um, it, it kind of doesn't matter which side of the divide you're on. Uh, I, I kind of make the same assumptions about people on any side of any conflict in that sense. I think, I, I don't think, okay, let me put it this way. I think the reason I don't like beefing culture and this is beyond uh, Nassim Taleb is that any larger conflict with, two sides and like two large teams, if the two groups are sufficiently large, um, my default assumption is that they're kind of like all going to be average humans on either side. And beefing kind of makes this presumption that our side is the noble good tribe and those people are like irredeemably evil people. And I find that starting assumption really, I don't know, puts me off and I think it's sort of intellectually a dangerous one to make that your side is like morally superior or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I mean, it feels like the culture of beefs is very like, it is kind of like, I wouldn't say army-esque, but like Knight Templar, like run a whole <laughs> yeah. crusade. And I feel like I got that from your essay, but I might be wrong about that. Like the Knight Crusade thing. Yeah. Like, you know, like champion, there's like the champion and then all the like guys behind him. And it's yeah. kind of like being at a tourney for a match. Um, and it's interesting because I'm going to bring this back to like my favorite. Um, Jane Jacobs is probably one of my favorite thinkers from the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. um, probably farther than that. She had I a big beef with Robert Moses, right? Like you could call what she had with Robert Moses a beef. More than a beef, but... Yeah, I don't know about that because the thing about her conflict with Robert Moses was like very specifically around a single like issue. Like they wanted to like raise parts. I think there were a couple of things. One of them was like they wanted to put a highway through a park in her neighborhood. Um, mm -hmm. Her beefs were like very around, like very much around practical actions that Robert Moses' organizations were trying to take against her neighborhood. I don't know if that qualifies as yeah. 
feels a little different. Um, I think the mechanics were the same. I, I think um, uh, there was the immediate issue of um, that particular neighborhood and the highway through it. But in, in general, also like Moses and uh, Jacobs, they represent two very different philosophies of urbanism, right? And that's since become almost institutionalized as those are the two ways you think about urbanism. So in that sense, I think there was enough philosophical depth to it. But again, I, I haven't actually read the, um, I haven't read either Jane Jacobs' uh, Death and Life of Great American Cities, right? And uh, the other one is Robert Caro's um, book on Robert Moses. I haven't read either of them. Okay. So I'm bullshitting. Bullshit should be added to our B list. So I'm bullshitting at a Wikipedia level of knowledge about both of them. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. So um, just to comment really quickly on the, the Power Burger, it's actually interesting because Robert Carroll wrote a whole chapter on the Jane Jacobs saga with the mothers of, I think, the West Village or whatever um, mm -hmm. organization that Jane Jacobs was like one of the most active activists in that group. Um, he wrote a whole chapter about it and it didn't make it in the book. So there's not actually, like the combat between Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses, I don't know if she knew that was exactly who she was fighting. She might've figured it out eventually. Oh, okay. But none of her writing actually talks about it. Um, anyways, so like the Jane Jacobs thing, the reason I bring her up has to do with a book she wrote later in her life. Um, I think she wrote it in like 70s or 80s called Systems of Survival. Um, oh yeah, I love that. The, the traders and guardians thing, right? I've written a few posts about that. One of my favorite ideas. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> and the internet of beefs or like the beef tribes remind me a lot of the guardians. And like, I feel like the value systems of yep. the beefers, you can easily say are, um, are guardian. That's guardian syndrome. She calls them syndromes. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I am not, I am not a guardian. I, I do not fit into the guardian syndrome. That is not my way of living life at all. I am, I can't remember what you she called the other one. I think traders or merchants or like. Uh, commerce. I think it's the commerce syndrome. Oh yeah. yeah. I'm definitely yeah, yeah. commerce syndrome. Oh yeah. No, no, I think both of us are. Um, I'm actually surprised I didn't make that connection in my beefs article because I've written, I think three articles that were inspired by the, um, syndromes thing and uh, one of them i explicitly call this out I, I think it was called the economics of pricelessness where uh, my argument was that the guardian crowd tends to make arguments with this sort of presumption of shared priceless values and in a way you can't argue around that whereas the commerce crowd their approach to debate and discussion tends to be much more pragmatic it's like let's not talk about our priceless values let's talk about the you know, price of things, as in, you know, let's get at value through price mechanisms. And that leads to interesting dynamics. Uh, I was actually thinking uh, that's a good segue point to another B topic um, that we should talk about, which is uh, Biden versus Bernie. I got that mm. uh, sense in the debate that Bernie is very much a guardian um, a syndrome guy and Biden is very much commerce in a specific uh, sense of horse trading on, you know, the floor of Congress, uh, mm -hmm. pragmatically trying to get bills passed. Like repeatedly, they were talking past each other in a very specific way where Bernie kept sort of calling Biden out on uh, his voting record on particular sort of matters of principles and issues. And Biden kept trying to like defend himself in ways that sounded like, oh, we just needed to sort of, you know, give and take favors to get the bill passed in a way that actually moved things forward. Uh, and that struck me as interesting where Bernie's clearly, I think, uh, well, he's beefy for one. And second, he's very much guardian syndrome, um, entire sort of posture built around um, sort of uh, behaving in accordance with your values rather than in accordance to the compromises that might be needed to get things done. And I think that's kind of a distinction that I haven't seen anybody make about Bernie versus Biden. Oh. Yeah. Did you watch the debate? I did not watch the debate. I didn't really even know there was a debate going on. I had a friend who like, like I'm watching the debate like hours that I saw hours after it had happened. I'm like, oh. Um, what else did you pick up from the debate last night? Like between them, like just a is it just a syndrome stuff or like? 
that was one part of uh, i did get a, that sense of um, pragmatism like people have been saying about bernie that he's um, in many ways kind of like the left's version of trump and there's some very similar uh, things right like he has the same beef army like we talked about how there's knights and mooks of the candidates in both this election and the last one only two candidates have ever managed to build a tribe of like really uh, i don't know angry people willing to fight on twitter for them and trump is of course one on the right and bernie is the one on the left so I think that validates the perception that he's um, got sort of the guardian syndrome approach to stuff. And um, on the other hand, I don't want to like uh, condone what Biden represents. Like Biden and to a certain extent, uh, Elizabeth Warren, like we are both uh, sort of disappointed that Warren didn't make it through, but she was trying to like thread a very fine needle of, I'm an insider who knows how to work Congress and get bills passed and make all the, you know, do all the wheeling and dealing on the inside. But I am going to also be the uh, radical left leaning champion on the outside. And I think fundamentally that narrative didn't come together. Whereas Bernie has gone all pure. It's like, I'm going to be the leader of the revolutionary masses on the outside and I will make no compromises on the floor of uh, Congress. Whereas Biden is very much, I'm sort of the stopgap leader figure. I know how to get deals done. I'm going to make all the incremental things that are possible by like, you know, basically compromising all over the place. And that's not a good look when you have to talk in public, like on a campaign stump speech, somebody like Bernie comes across much better, right? Because you can say, I have values against the war in Iraq. I have values against um, uh, or pro gay marriage. And I live my values and I vote my values when bills come to the floor of Congress. But as, Biden has to sort of hem and haw and explain that, oh yeah, I have these values, but my voting record doesn't reflect it. And his stump speech looks much weaker, right? So he can't be the knight leading a bunch of moves. Right, that's what I wanted to kind of add to that is it looks weak from a guardian syndrome perspective, right? Like if you're a guardian, yeah. if you were a guardian value thinker or person or a participant in the you know economy of beefs, or whatever um yeah biden is completely um on like it's not a value system that you understand or even want to like condone right whereas um yeah yeah it is interesting i wonder if this was kind of like this is an interesting point about politics right like and i've kind of been saying for a while that i think the most interesting the most entertaining primary is it they're called primary not primary general the general election um the most interesting general election would be to see trump against bernie but i think that's because both of them have the biggest army of mooks so really i'm saying like yeah i want to watch like these two guys with their like mook armies go at it like that's entertainment like let's have that tourney like let's have them like joust on the field of like public opinion because like that, you know, like they have their adherents, as you pointed out, are like very similar in their mechanisms of combat and value systems and like expressing themselves. So I do think that that would make, you know, beefs make good entertainment. Like it's, it's far more entertaining than the pragmatic, like, yeah, I voted for that thing and here's what we got out of it. Um, uh, yeah, I think that definitely it would make for the most entertaining election uh, but in a way i think it wouldn't address the fundamental conflict that has driven the last few elections which is i think between technocrat institutionalists on the one hand and uh, populists who kind of sense that their needs are not being served like e even right now with uh, the stock market crash given the virus and um, the healthcare crisis again with the virus you can kind of see the uh, responses like uh, Bernie in the debate was all about high principles, Medicare for all, and Biden was all about the mechanics of how would you actually do that? How would you get that passed on the floor of Congress? How would you do blah, blah, blah. So uh, you can kind of see the differences in how uh, sort of longtime institutionalists like Biden, who's, you, who's had a history of making compromises to get things done, approaches a crisis versus somebody who views a crisis as almost a moral, religious test of something or the other. And sometimes it's not even clear what the hell it's a test of, right? Like right now, the economy is melting down. And from a principle standpoint, I'm very strongly in favor of 
we bailed out the banks last time. Let's try it slightly differently this time. So with my limited knowledge of economics, my instinct is do some sort of stimulus at the small business level, direct fiscal support, and the monetary stuff of interest rate moving around is not going to do much, but do whatever minimum is necessary to help the banks, but focus on the direct support. Um, and that's sort of a, if you bring this, I think if Biden or Bernie were uh, coming at this problem, even though Trump is in office now, it would be interesting to see how they would actually try to operationalize whatever they stand for when it comes to, all right, what do you specifically do? Who do you offer low interest loans? Whose taxes do you forgive? That test, neither of has been, neither of them has been through, but I suspect Biden's response would be much more pragmatic and it would actually work. It would do the, it would work, but it would not perhaps do the right thing. Whereas Bernie's response would try to do the right thing, but it might not actually work. Right. So there's that kind of like difference. Like it's like, yeah, do the thing right versus do the right thing is one big distinction between the idealists and uh, pragmatists. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually like, so this kind of like, I want to loop this around to the Bitcoin topic. Um, just kind of like in a sort of not necessarily Bitcoin, but kind of like a, the crypto in general. So mm -hmm. I think that what you're talking about is like a, at some point it becomes a distribution problem, right? Um, we want to help. We need to figure out the mechanism of helping. Um, it seems like a lot, there has been some talk in Congress, interestingly on both sides of the aisle, right? Like I've, I've been seeing people retweeting Republican, I don't know if they're Senator, Congress members um, who are advocating for like a thousand dollars in everyone's pocket, like tomorrow kind of thing. Um, it kind of be, it's a, like, it's okay. So like you want to help, it's like you want to distribute money. So we're basically printing money, right? We're going to print some money and we're going to, we need to decide how we're going to get all that printed money out to the people, right? Or who we're going to give it to. Um, past, in the past and typically the way that the money comes out is via the Fed, right? And the direct people, the first in line to get that money are the banks. Um, I thought that there were like only like 20 banks or financial institutions that could directly access the Fed. Like there's like, it's not like any yeah. bank, right? It's not just like your, like I bank at like credit union. It's not like the mom and pop credit union can go to the Fed and get money. There's like a whole hierarchy of how close you are to the Fed, where this, which becomes in the case of like, a monetary stimulus, a um, font of money, yep. right? And you have to, how close are you to that fountain really depends on sign of an institutional hierarchy that's been decided yep. before, way before any of this happens, right? All those are already decided. Like you already have the pathways laid out and you just like yep. pour the money in and it's in theory flows out that way, right? And then at some point the banks have discussion about exactly where that ends up and who they make loans to, and what loans they forgive yep. or don't let ride, whatever. Um, so that's like, that solves the distribution problem of we have capital and we're gonna flow it out. Like we've set up the system and we like turn the spigot and then it flows out through kind of like down cascades mm -hmm. down a fancy fountain, right? Um, what you and are talking about or like the universal basic income is like, okay, well we're gonna turn on a spigot and instead of putting it onto this like bank infrastructure fountain that we've built, um, we're going to give it to people, but then you get this question of, well, how do we get a thousand dollars to every person? We, like we have trouble counting every, every adult in America. It's called the census. We do it every 10 years. It's like, yep. especially this year, we have like some problems figuring out how to count people exactly and where they are. Um, There's a couple of wrinkles to that. Like, um, I think I, I just learned this a few days ago, but apparently in sort of um, classical economics of like, you know, the spherical cow uh, variety where you make all sorts of like simplifying assumptions. Um, it kind of doesn't matter where you inject money into an economic system. So in theory, in a textbook theory, it doesn't matter where you inject money into an economic system. But in practice, there's um, this idea called the Cantillon effect, which um, I learned about sometime in the last year, which yeah. says that it actually matters a great deal, whether you're putting it in the top and letting it trickle down or pumping it into the bottom and letting it trickle up, right? And Bitcoin is, 
uh, I think another <laughs> idea about how you move value around. No, no. So this is where it gets okay. So this is where it gets really interesting. Actually, the last talk I gave at, was at a Lightning conference in Berlin, and I talked about this. And um, how did I define it? Oh, so the way that I kind of put it in terms of like inflation, like so you have a currency supply. And then you decide mm -hmm. you want to expand the currency supply, so you're going to print add more dollars. You're going to add more to the total amount of dollars that exist. Um, and then, so there's two types of like inflation. I can't remember exactly what I called them, but there's one type of inflation that has to do with something. And then there's another that's like this problem of like we who make the money want to give out more money to the system. How do we inject it into the system? That's like a, that's a very specific type. That's like monetary supply inflation. Like we're literally making mm -hmm. supply bigger. Yeah, I've heard that too. Yeah, um, and I don't know what the official things are. I just made this all up, and then later found out there's something called the Contrillion effect because someone came up to me after the talk was like, "Oh, you're talking about this?" I'm like, "Oh, yes." That, <laughs> someone else has also observed this. I I see that now. Anyways, crypto is really interesting because all these different crypto systems each have their own way that they solve this problem. Um, yeah. Which I think is really interesting. So, like, the cool thing about cryptocurrencies is they are, to some extent, like, miniature experiments on how different currency systems and inflation and, like, how do we distribute more money that is created every round of whatever? Like, how does that get it? Who gets it? Is, um, yep. yeah, like, every, not everyone, but a lot of them have different methods of doing it. Um, so, like, Bitcoin is a lottery, and you play the lottery, so every 10 minutes, new Bitcoin gets handed out to someone um, and it's like a lottery. And the way that you play the lottery is by running a mining machine. Mm -hmm. um, and if you win the lottery, you get the Bitcoin. It's yours. Um, and so a lot of people play in the lottery because a lot of people want the Bitcoin that hands out. And so like that becomes a random, I mean, it's basically a random generator, like a random. Yeah. Uh, of course, there's the wrinkles of like, if you have um, high scale mining capacity concentrated in China, the you you can sort of, so you, it's sort of almost you need to brute force um, uh, the mining capacity to get it. Uh, uh, but there's another kind of interesting distribution angle that um, struck me. I wasn't initially thinking about the mining um, approach to distributing money, which is the sort of um, the equivalent of like printing money for governments. But I was thinking about forks, right? Like each time there's a fork, suddenly magically in my crypto account, a new currency appears with a certain amount of dollar value. And it's like, it was really weird the first time it happened with um, the Ethereum Classic, then it happened with BCH, then there's a new fork. So like four or five times in my portfolio, I've had like random new currencies worth like something yeah. appear, right? And this whole concept of like airdropping um, currencies and tokens onto people, like I think there's something really fascinating there. Like if the government even the, wanted to do it. Airdrop, but the airdrop, yeah, I was say, but the airdrop is the same, is like a different way of saving, solving the same problem that mining solves in Bitcoin. Like they have like yeah. an currency, yeah. they want to get it out to a bunch of people. Who do they give it to? Um, Sometimes it's whoever put their name in an email box two weeks before the deadline, right? Um, yeah. Sometimes it's like I recently got uh, airdrop coins because I have a key on GitHub and they just like sent out <laughs> 4,000 handshake tokens to people who had like keys in the right places. You just got them. That was how, that was their distribution mechanism, right? Like that yep. was how they decided who they were going to give money to, to stimulate. Like, so this, Airdrops in particular are a good example, right? They're trying to stimulate an economy around this token. Um, and the way that they do that is by deciding who gets the tokens. And so someone, some architect somewhere made a decision about how they were going to hand out those tokens and who's going to have them. So who would be incentivized to like, participate in their network? Um, yeah. And I think the interesting thing about the examples from the crypto world is just how wide of a variety of mechanisms they can access. Like just about any unique identifier that's validable, validated, you can use it to distribute um, things. Whereas if you look at what governments can do, they really only have, I think, two mechanisms. One is they can decide to take less money away from you. So they can do basically payroll tax deductions or annual end of year uh, tax uh, things. And uh, right now, for example, like this thousand dollars in everybody's pocket, I think is kind of stupid. It's too sort of uh, crude and blanket. What I would like to see is it 
going more smartly towards the most affected small businesses, like you know, restaurants, hairdressers, food service professionals. And that's an interesting targeting problem where if, if in an ideal crypto world, all the restaurants were on some sort of restaurant blockchain, you could easily sort of do this like in an instant, you could airdrop um, currency there. But right now I'm thinking, what could you actually do? You could have, you would have to go to the business entity registration database. You would have to look up all the LLCs that are listed as food service. And you would have to say for those employer ID numbers, we are going to pump, uh, we are going to basically augment payroll somehow. It's like the mechanism design would be horrendous. So that's actually going to be, it would be good well, to live in a crypto world for that. I say the tax office has all of their, I mean, the business office has all of their addresses. You could just mail them all a check or like if they did yeah. work deposit last year, I don't know, but it does become, yeah, there's, it's a registration problem, right? And this is why like yeah. one of my crit criticisms of universal vacant basic income is that I feel like in order to make it work, you need a national registry. Um, every citizen needs to be tracked, uh, which I'm like, I don't know how I feel about that. Um, so like, well, universal basic income may be coming. I feel like in order to get it, we're going to create a national citizen registry. Like that is going to be a prerequisite to it or. Oh yeah, totally. Like, yeah, I don't know. And I don't know how I feel about that as like the um, person who kind of likes not being, I mean, I'm very easy to find. <laughs> well, you do have a pretty, also. you have, um, uh, have you heard of this concept called a gray man? No. You, what is that? Gray woman. But um, uh, gray man ideology is basically this idea of like, try and blend in, try and not stand out. And if you're being like a prepper for extreme circumstances, you don't want to be in all kinds of camo and tactical gear with an AR-15 or something. You want to totally blend in. If you're living in some hipster neighborhood, you want to dress as a hipster. So you might have like all the toilet paper and ammo stockpiled in your bunker, but you don't want to look like that, right? And I think there's, that's, an, that's an interesting tension between the ability of complex systems to do meaningful targeting and sort of distribute resources in the most rational way possible. And on the other hand, the incentive for uh, people trying to prepare for resilience to not actually be easily discoverable, right? Like actually a good example, uh, not for prepper uh, crowd, but restaurants, right? So many people who are most impacted right now by people shutting down from like food service and buying food and going to restaurants, a lot of these are going to be actually uh, illegal immigrants running like really cool mom and pop shops or whatever, right? So you've got like a lot of people who fly under the radar for the food service and restaurant business. And what's going to end up happening is people who are employed as hourly workers at McDonald's, they're kind of like reachable. People who are full-time employees are very reachable. Part-time employees are less reachable. People who are working... Um, kind of undocumented for the best mom and pop taco shop down the street, they're not as reachable. So the distribution problem, I think there's a fundamental trade-off with the, I don't know, security from evil systems problem. <laughs> so uh, that's a fundamental trade-off. I haven't really thought about that as much. Like if you want access to public collective resources, you're going to have to choose between that, therefore making yourself visible to the system versus defending yourself from that same system turning evil, right? Yes, exactly, yeah. 100%. And I think we're going to run into that with so, uh, virus stuff as well. Like a lot of people who should be protected, like homeless people, how are you going to vaccinate them or isolate them? You don't, you can't, you don't, you can't. <laughs> like, you, I don't even think that, like, I don't even think San Francisco exactly knows how many homeless people they have. Like, they don't, I yeah. mean, it goes back to that. Like, there's counts. But when did they count? Did you count on a rainy day? Um, <laughs> like, yeah, I've heard, I've heard, I've heard things, mostly rumors on Twitter about how, you know, cities get their homeless counts down based on strategic timing of when they conduct their counts. Um, yeah. I've talked, to, been, I've talked to a couple of people who work with the homeless people here in LA and I live in downtown that's just a few blocks over from uh, Skid Row. So it's obvious walking through just how desperate and extreme the problem is. 
Um, but uh, yeah, if you're trying to reach this population in a systematic way for any reason, whether it's to distribute money or resources, whether it's to do healthcare uh, surveys, whether it's to do just basic census, you're faced with the same sort of legibility problem, the whole seeing like a state James Scott thing. So we should get to that at, in our, when we talk about L topics, right? Legibility, which I think um, is a big topic for our audience. But I think um, the virus has created, has made that topic very clear, like the response of China versus the response of the US. A big part of it is how much the population is willing to accept authoritarian um, sort of mechanisms for collective welfare um, and willing to give up, I don't know, certain civil protections. And you can see like videos coming out of China, people being dragged by people in hazmat suits out of their homes uh, for, I guess, the community's protection. Whereas you try that in the US, you're going to have, um, I don't know, uh, all yeah, kinds of like compound yeah. standoffs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, David Koresh kind of stuff. You're going to have, I think we're going to see that if the situation gets much worse out where you are in Texas, I think a bunch of people living in like uh, militia compounds are going to like create weird little standoffs. No, I don't know if it's this compound issues. Compounds we'll full see. of coronavirus. We'll see if it comes to that. Yeah, I don't know. Out in the country, yeah, in the city. Yeah, I don't know. That's hard to say. Yeah, it's. Well, we can talk about C for contagion um, next week. <laughs> this, this virus thing is going to show up across the it, alphabet. I think it's going to be here for a while. Yeah. All right. Well, I think I think we have we are kind of running out of time. Um, so maybe we should wrap it up. Um, right. Yeah. We covered a bunch of B topics. So all the Bs hit all the Bs almost. Yeah. Um, well, we'll circle great. back around okay, cool. next week. All right. Good. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in, uh, listeners. This has been another episode of um, Scorpio Season. All right. See you next time, my cat. See you, Lisa. Bye. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber-only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.